Let's take a look at how we record uncertainties in our experimental work. In the previous videos, we talked about uncertain digits and significant figures. We talked about random uncertainty and systematic error. And we said if we, say, wrote down a number like 40.3, that that really represented a range of values. That if you were to repeat your measurement, you'd be awfully confident that the new measurement is going to be somewhere between 40.25 and 40.349 repeater, or just 40.35. And here's a very simple way to notate that range. We could simply say 40.3 plus or minus 0 0.05. When you now subtract the value, you get the lower end of the range, and when you add 0 0.05, you get the upper end of the range. So this becomes a handy notation. And this number here is the uncertainty. But this also gives you a lot more flexibility. Because suppose you are actually very confident that the range should be between, say, 40.28 and 40.32. So now we can represent that as well. We could write this as 40.3 plus or minus 0 0.02. There's also another advantage to this notation. If I write 40.3 plus or minus 0 0.02, then when I start adding and subtracting off the uncertainty, because there's a zero in this decimal place, I can't change that digit. So this digit here is fixed. It's known. And it's in the second decimal place here that I'll be making changes. So it's really this second digit that is your first uncertain digit. And we really should write a zero in there because that's our first uncertain digit. So as a general rule, what we want to do is write the uncertainty and the value to the same number of decimal places. So if I have two decimal places in my uncertainty, I should have two decimal places in my value. Okay, so hopefully this is a very easy IB question. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer, and hopefully you said it, the answer is C, because if I subtract 0.2 from 50, I get the lower end of the range, and if I add 0.2 to 50, I get the upper end of the range. The question now becomes, if you make a measurement, how do you estimate the uncertainty in that measurement? And I have a few guidelines for you here. The first is to remember that uncertainties are rough estimates. And so what you've really got to do is to ask yourself, over what range am I confident that future measurements, keeping everything consistent, will lie within? That's really what it's all about. You've got to keep in mind that every measurement is different. And that means you have to use your gumption. You have to use your common sense. Now, just because I said every measurement's different doesn't mean we don't have some rules of thumb. And we use these rules of thumb in standard situations where we've got an easy measurement. There aren't any real complications to the measurement. So we have a rule when we're, where we're using scales. A scaled thermometer, a protractor, an analog meter, a meter stick, etc. And our very simple rule is simply that the uncertainty will be equal to half the smallest scale division. So this protractor is marked in degrees. So our uncertainty would be plus or minus 0 0.5 degrees, half a degree. Every dash on this ammeter here is worth 2 amperes. Our uncertainty would be half that much. It would be plus or minus 1 ampere. 
This ruler here is marked in millimeters, so our uncertainty would be 0 0.5 millimeters. But that really assumes, but use your gumption when you're using a ruler. If I'm measuring something like a flat piece of paper where I've got clear edges and I can lay the ruler right on top of the paper, then 0.5 millimeters is a good estimate. But what if I'm measuring something like a sphere and I want to measure its diameter? Then it's not so easy to estimate those edges. And we have to take that into account. And I've heard some people say that if you're measuring something with a ruler, you really have to estimate the beginning and the end as well. And therefore, it's two measurements and your uncertainty really should be twice that amount or one millimeter. I don't think that's necessary if it's an easy measurement. But there isn't a right or wrong answer. When I read your lab, what I'm most interested in is that you've given a reasonable justification for the size of the uncertainty that you've assigned. Our second rule is for digital meters. But once again, use your gumption. If you see that smallest digit fluctuating at all, you should use the size of the fluctuations to estimate your uncertainty. If it's not fluctuating, then generally you can say that the uncertainty will equal one unit in the smallest digit shown on the meter. So in this example, the smallest digit is one decimal place. So our uncertainty would be plus or minus a one in the first decimal place, or plus or minus 0.1. Keep in mind that uncertainties are rough estimates. And for that reason, we usually just round them to one significant digit. I'll show you an example of an exception to that rule later. But for most cases, round to one significant digit. So for instance, in this reading here, half the smallest scale division would be 2.5. And our actual reading is 115. We wouldn't leave it that way because our uncertainty right here is two significant digits and we'd round up to 3 so that our result would be 115 plus or minus 3 units. Let's try an IB question. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. The first thing we want to do is determine the uncertainty. That's supposed to equal half the smallest scale division. Each scale division is one unit, therefore the uncertainty is 0 0.5 units. Therefore, the correct answer is either A or D. So we've got to choose between 6.0 and 6.2, and this turns out to be kind of tricky. In chemistry, you're taught when reading graduated cylinders to use the bottom of the meniscus. So this would be a graduated cylinder. What we're looking at here is a thermometer, and the meniscus goes the other way because it's essentially a vacuum in the thermometer. So we went to the bottom of the meniscus here because those little edges don't contain much liquid. We will go to the top of the meniscus here because there's not much air in those little pockets. So the correct answer should have been D, 6.2 plus or minus 0.5. What often happens when we make a measurement and repeat it is we get large fluctuations in those values due to one or more factors. And if that's the case, we can't use our simple rules of using half the smallest scale division, etc. And a very common example of that is with time measurements. So let's say we've got a marble and we're going to drop it from a certain height and measure how much time it takes to get to the bottom. And typically you'd have a stopwatch in hundredths of a second. So let's say you did five trials and these were the five times you got in seconds. Now, we like to do trials because the average value is supposed to converge towards the true value, and so the more trials we do, the more accurate our results should be. But what also is great about trials is that you can begin to see the range of values. So here's the low end of our range, and here's the high end of our range. And if we've got a range, we can estimate the uncertainty. 
So even though we, we have a stopwatch measuring in a hundredth of a second, our fluctuations are much, much bigger than that. And what's causing those fluctuations? You might say human reaction time, and that would be good. But remember, because of human reaction time, you're going to start by about 0.2 seconds late. And you're also going to end about 0.2 seconds late. And those two effects should kind of cancel each other out. It's not really the human reaction time that's causing the fluctuations. It's really because your human reaction time varies. And that's what's causing the fluctuations. So it's really variations in human. So typically in an example like this, human reaction time about 0.2 seconds, you'd actually find the fluctuations here to be less than that. So let's take our example with the times we had these five trials and we'll use those five times to determine the uncertainty in the time for the ball to fall. Let's work out the average first. And before you start this, you might eliminate some outliers. I think some people would eliminate this value as 0.34 because it seems to be considerably higher than the other values. If you don't eliminate it, then your average will come out to be 0.246. To work out the uncertainty, just take the maximum value, the highest value in the range, and subtract off the minimum value, the lowest value in the range, and then divide by 2. So in this case, we'd have 0 0.34 minus 0 0.18 divided by 2, which is going to give you 0 0.08. So we'd write that the time is 0 0.25 plus or minus 0 0.08 seconds. Notice here, one significant digit in the uncertainty. That digit is in the second decimal place, so I want to round my value here to the second decimal place. And take note here, this formula here works because you've got a maximum value and a minimum value and then a range between them. And so typically your average value falls right in the center. So then if we add on this amount, the range over 2, will get up to the maximum value. If we subtract off this amount here, once again, the range over 2, will get down to the minimum value. So our uncertainty is just equal to that range, max minus min, divided by 2. I said earlier that I'd give you an example of when you might want to keep two significant figures in your uncertainty. Let's say we had done some time trials. We might have done 5 or 100 time trials. And let's say the average value came out to be 0 0.246 and the range of values divided by 2 came out to be 0 0.15. Now, if I choose to go to one significant digit, I round up 0.15 becomes 0.2. Now, my uncertainty is in the first decimal place, so I want to round this to the first decimal place. I'll get 0 0.3. And the problem that we end up with is that this 0 0.3 is significantly bigger than 0.246. And so we've kind of lost some of our centering. So if you go to two significant digits in your uncertainty, then it'd be plus or minus 0 0.15, and you'd keep an extra digit here, 0 0.25. And I think this would be a better representation because effectively you haven't messed up the centering of your average value. And to finish off, let's see how we record values and uncertainties into our raw data table. So the raw data table for pretty much any of your physics experiments will have the same basic format. In the first column, the independent variable, that's the one you set, and it will always be in that first column. The dependent variable, that's the one you're really measuring, its different trial values will go in columns going across the page. So then you can find the average of those trial values, and that would go in this box. And then you'd use max minus min over 2 from those trials and use that to generate an uncertainty. 
Now, as we go across here, these are called trials. As we change the independent variable, as we go from here to here and here to here, changing that independent variable, we call those increments. Often I'll have students call changes in the independent variable trials. They're increments and the different measured values are the trials. And one other point, with the uncertainties here, if you're not seeing a clear trend in the uncertainties, like if these uncertainties seem to clearly be increasing as you did your increments, then you'd want to keep individual uncertainty values here. But you might find that you can represent all of these uncertainties by one typical value. And that can simplify your work a fair amount. And often it's a more accurate way of doing things. So for instance, if you were to see 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.3. There's no clear obvious trend there and as a typical value I wouldn't choose the smallest value. In this case here I'd probably use 0 0.4 or maybe 0 0.3. It's better to overestimate your uncertainty than to underestimate your uncertainty. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.